Hello and welcome to the Consist of the Coke YouTube channel. I'm your host for this video, Reverend Jake Zabel, the St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church located in Dolby, Queensland, Australia. We're gathered here again on the Bible study couch to continue our Bible study series on the explanation of Luther's 95 Theses. So Martin Luther in 1517 wrote his 95 Theses. He later wrote for them an explanation, giving his own well, explanation on what the 95 Theses were and what each thesis meant and how they were to be understood and a little bit more extra detail on them. I have read through Martin Luther's uh, explanation on 95 Theses and I have now given my simplification of Luther's explanation. So this is my simplified explanation of Luther's explanation of the 95 Theses. Um, we're up now to thesis number 59 to kick off this video. We're almost into the last third, so let's get underway. Luther writes in thesis 59, Saint Lawrence said that the poor of the church were the treasures of the church, but he spoke according to the usage of the word in his own time. So here Luther is kind of still addressing this issue of the treasury of merit, but Luther writes, Saint, well, Luther said that St. Lawrence referred to the poor as the treasure of the church. Luther says that in his day the word treasure had taken on a very different meaning. Uh, to, to his day as in as Luther's day. In Luther's day the word treasure had taken on a different meaning. So that men no longer considered the poor to be the treasure of the church. See, originally the word treasure or thesaurus in Latin means something to be valued or a beloved friend. Uh, thus when St. Lawrence said that the poor of the church were the treasure of the church, he meant that the poor of the church was something of value. Yet in Luther's day the word treasure meant a collection or a storehouse of valued things. Thus in Luther's day the word Treasure referred to something that could be bought and sold, like a chest full of gold. Thus, when using the original meaning of the treasury of merit of the saints, it meant something valuable and precious. Thus, the merits of the saints were valuable insofar as they had benefit for the church, in, they had benefited the church in their lives by growing and strengthening the church. However, in the Middle Ages, the meaning of treasure meant something that could be bought and sold, and so the treasury of merit was now to be understood as a physical treasure that was stored up and could be sold and bought. So in other words, what Luther is really getting at is the, the whole idea of the treasury of merit, which as we mentioned in the previous video, it was this papist doctrine that the saints had done enough good works that they didn't need to spend any time in purgatory. And they had done so many additional good works that those good works, the, the merit of those good works, could be distributed through the sale of indulgences. So when you bought an indulgence or you went and did a pilgrimage or some kind of ritual that earned an indulgence, you were receiving the merit of the saints in heaven. It was being distributed to you. That's the idea of the treasury of merit. And Luther's saying, look, when we talk about the treasury of, of the saints, when we talk about it in the original usage of the word treasure, it just means something valuable. So the treasure of the saints, says Luther, in the original usage of that word simply means the valuable things done by the saints. So, the saints were faithful people. The saints were righteous people. They did a lot of good works. They grew the church. They preached the word of God. This is a great treasure for the church because it's a valuable thing that they did. However, says Luther, that's not what the papists are meaning when they use the word treasury of the saints. They're using the word in a medieval understanding of the word treasure, which means, like, you know, a, a chest full of gold that can be distributed. And so Luther's saying, look, 
you're actually using the word treasure incorrectly. The original meaning of the word treasure just meant something that would be considered valuable. And yes, there is a treasure of the saints in the sense that the work of the saints was very valuable to the growth and life of the church thereafter. So, yes, we can technically talk about a treasury of merit of the saints in the sense that the saints had done many great things for the church and that is to be considered a great treasure but it is not a literal physical treasure as in gold and silver that can be distributed or something that can be bought and sold so essentially Luther's trying to say that one could talk about a treasury of merit but not in the sense that the papists are talking about it uh, which moves on now to thesis 60 Without want of consideration, we say that the keys of the church, given by the merits of Christ, are that treasure. So, Luther says that without consideration or thought, the indulgent preachers have been teaching that the keys of the church, which Christ gave to his church in Matthew 16, 19 and 18, 18 and John 20 as well, uh, thus they agree that in Matthew 16, 19, that Christ gave the church the power to give indulgences. In the following thesis, Luther uses this belief of the indulgence sellers um, to prove that indulgences do not grant the merits of Christ or the saints. Um, so let's move on to thesis 61, which says, it is clear that the Pope's power is of itself sufficient for the remission of penalties and cast reserved but and cast and case sorry I'll, I'll start that over for it is clear that the Pope's power is of itself sufficient for the remission of penalties and cases reserved by himself the Pope's power is sufficient for indulgences says Luther the merits of Christ are not needed for indulgences. And this kind of goes back to what Luther was going on before, that he says that indulgences are only to deal with temporal punishments and canonical penalties. And so this is something we've really talked a lot in the previous studies, where indulgences originally were essentially a certificate for absolution, because what would happen is if somebody did something that was scandalous, a public sin in the church, they would then be put under what was called a canonical penalty. Uh, this would be something like if you were having sex before marriage, you, you couldn't come to communion until you got married. Or if you had stolen from the church, then you were banned from um, being a treasurer in the church and, and stuff like that. That's what a canonical penalty was. It was something that the church imposed that says, because you have done X sin, there is a temporal consequence for this sin. An indulgence was kind of like a pardon or something. So in the case, a good case is if you were stealing from the church, from the church and then they said you were banned from being a treasurer. Well, then you follow the case of Zacchaeus and you not only return the money you stole, but you pay back fourfold. And then the church says, okay, look, we're going to accept this as an acknowledgement that you are really sorry. We're going to remove the ban from you being the church treasurer. We're going to let you be the treasurer again. And the indulgence would serve as a certificate of absolution, kind of like a church pardon for a church penalty. That's essentially what indulgences were originally for. And Luther is heavily in his 95 Theses arguing that that is still how indulgences should be treated in the medieval period. And so when Luther says that the merits of Christ are not needed for indulgences, what he's saying is, look, these are, these are temporal punishments. These are church penalties. These aren't eternal punishments. And these aren't the wrath of God. Those, we need the merits of Christ. We need Christ to make atonement for our eternal punishment. But when it comes to temporal consequences, like being banned from being a church treasurer or even having to go to prison for doing a crime, those temporal punishments don't need the blood of Christ to die for them, nor can really the blood of Christ remove those because they're not, they're not punishments given by God. So Luther is saying here that the merits of Christ are not needed for indulgences because indulgences deal with 
the temporal consequences and church punishments. Therefore, the, the Pope has sufficient power to declare indulgences. That the Pope, as the head of the church, essentially, or the, the earthly head of the church, um, has authority to remove these canonical penalties. So, in this sense, if, say, somebody had been stealing from the church and so they were put under a canonical penalty and banned from being a treasurer of the congregation, well, then the Pope could override the local congregation, is essentially the papal understanding. And so Luther's saying, look, the, the Pope, by papal decree, has the power to remit these penalties. Therefore, you don't need the merit of Christ or the merit of the saints to have anything to do with indulgences. Um, as Luther goes on, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Uh, this verse says nothing about the application of merits. In addition, Luther argues that the verse refers to whatever, that is, the duties of the Pope, ex including excommunication, absolution, ordination, defrocking, command, prohibitions, etc. Therefore, if the merit of Christ was given in indulgences, as these indulgence preachers are claiming, then the merit of Christ should be given and removed in regards of whatever the Pope binds or looses. Thus, the Pope would bestow the merits of Christ when absolving or ordaining. For if the merit of Christ is to be distributed anywhere, it's distributed through the means of grace. So Luther finishes uh, Thesis 61 by arguing that if the loosing is bestowed, if the loosing was a bestowal of merit, then binding must be a withdrawal of merit. And that is the logical conclusion. But nowhere is it ever taught that the binding of sin withdrew the merit of the saints back into the treasury. So in other words, Luther is saying, look, if, if there was ever a distribution of the merits of the saints, then it would take place in, like, the absolution. But when we say to somebody that we're binding your sins, we don't say, well, we're taking back that additional merit from the saints. It it's just doesn't work that way. And so Luther said it's, it's, it's logical, this idea of the treasury of merit giving out the merit of the saints through indulgences. It's just, it's just completely illogical. Uh, which moves then on to Thesis 62. The true treasure of the church is most holy, is the most holy gospel of glory and the grace of God. Amen. That's uh, we should say Luther, amen, but let's let's go through Luther's explanation where Luther says that um, Christ has left nothing to the world except his gospel, which alone is the true treasure of the church. Jesus calls this treasure a hidden treasure, Matthew 13, 44. And because it is hidden, it is at the same time also neglected, said Luther. The gospel is the preaching of the incarnate Son of God, given to us for peace and salvation without any merit of our part. It is a word of salvation, a word of grace, a word of comfort, a word of joy, the voice of our bridegroom, a good word, a word of peace. But the law, on the other hand, is a word of destruction, a word of wrath, a word of sadness, a word of grief, a voice of the judge, a word of restlessness, and a word of curse. The law is the power of sin, 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The law brings wrath, Romans 4, 15. The law is a law of death, Romans, 5, Romans 7, 5, and 13. The law gives us an evil conscience, a restless heart, and a troubled breast because of our sin, which the law points out but does not remove. The, under the law, we are held captive, overwhelmed by sadness and despair. And so the gospel comes to us and says, Fear not! Comfort, comfort my people, encourage the faint-hearted, behold your God, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
Behold, the one who alone fulfills the law on your behalf, whom God has made to be your righteousness, your sanctification, your wisdom, your redemption. When the sinful and burdened conscience hears this sweet message, it comes alive. It shouts for joy and leaps about in confidence, no longer fearing death or hell. Therefore, those who seek indulgences due to fear of punishment have not heard the voice of Christ, but have only heard the voice of Moses. That is, they have not heard the words of the gospel, but only the word of the law. Here, Luther makes the argument that we are saved by God's grace apart from our works of the law. It is important to note that while the later Luther would totally do away with any form of synergism, that is, working with God, working our works contributing to our salvation, the early Luther who wrote the 95 Theses and this explanation was still very much a semi-Pelagian. But the early Luther did believe that we were saved eternally by God's grace alone. And that in regards to eternity, a work contributes nothing. However, he still believed that our sins were, our sins tainted our spirit, which needed to be cleansed by making amends of our sins. Any sin not amended before we died would be paid for in purgatory, and then we could go to heaven. It's only the later Luther who would reject this nonsense about purgatory. But we can see here already in Luther's explanation of Thesis 62 that he's beginning to lay the foundations for the doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It's still kind of corrupted at this point. It's a very papist view of justification, but we're getting there. This, 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 this thesis very much represents that Luther is still on a journey, but that he has begun that journey towards the true teachings of justification. Now, Thesis 63 and 64 should go hand in hand. Luther writes, but this treasure, this is verse, um, Thesis 63, Luther writes, this treasure is naturally most odious, for it makes the first to be last. And then 64, on the other hand, the treasures of indulgences is naturally most acceptable, for it makes the last to be first. The gospel confounds the things of man. It makes the strong weak and the wise foolish. The gospel teaches humility and the cross. For this reason, the gospel is despised by those who think themselves stronger and wiser than all the others. Those who seek to be first despise the gospel. However, the treasure of indulgences teaches people to tremble before punishment. It teaches man to despise hardship and trials. The treasure of indulgences makes the rich and powerful free of all punishment of sin, all fear of punishment of sin, while the poor and the needy are left in fear. In this way, those who seek to become, to become first, become first. So what Luther means here is that God's gospel makes the first last and the last first. But the sale of indulgences makes the first first and the last the last. See, the gospel is controversial because it turns the world on its head. It makes the weak strong. It makes the, the, the foolish wise. It makes the fool. It makes the wise foolish and it makes the strong weak. It makes the rich poor and the poor rich. The gospel is something that seems so just unusual to our human reason. Those who seek to be first will be humbled and made last, whereas those who humble themselves and try to be last will instead be exonerated and honoured and made first. That is how God's gospel works. Whereas indulgences follow the way of the world, they follow the way of our sinful flesh. They make the first first. They make the rich rich. They make the last last. They make the poor poor. For indulgences, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The prideful become more prideful. The humble are put to shame. So, 
with indulgences feed our flesh. They feed our sinful nature. They actually agree with the ways of the world. Indulgences are a human invention and they very much follow the human way of doing things, which is not God's way. So, for, uh, Theses 65 and 66 again go together. 65 says, Therefore the treasures of the gospel are nets with which one formerly fished for men of wealth. And 66 says, The treasures of indulgences are nets with which one now fishes for the wealth of men. Here Luther uses a play on words that the gospel w fishes for men of wealth while indulgences fish for wealth of men. This is not to say that the gospel seeks out only the rich and not the poor, but this is a play on words to teach the preachers of the gospel seek men while the indulgence preachers seek only money. Luther states that he is not against Christians contributing money to the building of the church, that what he is against is this extortion of money by the use of fear tactics. The indulgent preachers scare people into giving money, rather than asking people to simply donate money to the church out of love for God and their neighbour. Thesis 67 is the indulgences, which is the demagogues, sorry, the indulgences which the demagogues acclaim as the greatest grace are actually understood to be such only insofar as they promote gain. And Thesis 68, they are nevertheless in truth the most insignificant graces when compared with the grace of God and the piety of the cross. The demagogues, this is the leaders of the people, and indulgent preachers claim indulgences to be the greatest grace of God. For this reason, the laity unmistakably believed that God's grace was bestowed on them as soon as they purchased an indulgence. But in truth, when compared with the actual real grace of God and the piety of the cross, these indulgences are the most insignificant gifts. Indulgences are only great gifts insofar as they give money to the indulgent sellers. Indulgences in reality are not great gifts to those who buy the indulgences, but they are great gifts to those who sell the indulgences. In the same sense that illicit drugs, they're only a great gift for the people who sell them and make money, and they're actually something damaging and harmful to those who buy them. Uh, thesis 69 Bishops and curates are bound to admit the com commissaries of papal indulgences with all reverence. As Christians, we are called to submit to authority. For this reason, the bishops and pastors have been bound to submit to the indulgence sellers from Rome in all reverence. However, this command to submit to authority should not be understood in such a way that a person develops a false conscience and that unfair rulings are to be respected as if they were fair. As Christians we are to be obedient to authority and humble and humbly bear the burdens of an unfair decree. But even though we are to obey such a decree, we are not to call such an unfair decree fair. Thesis 70. But they are much more bound to strain their eyes and ears, lest these men preach their own dreams instead of what the Pope has commissioned. It is most certain that when a person bestows indulgences, his desire is that they be considered nothing more than indulgences, and that they have no value other than that which has, they have by their own nature. However, the Pope does permit them to have as much value as he grants. However, argued Luther, the Pope has not given these indulgent sellers such value. Here again to see that the early here again we see how much the early Luther was naive, and he thought that the Pope was innocent, and that these were just rogue indulgent sellers preaching contrary to the words of the Pope. Therefore, argues Luther, since the bishops are bound to the Pope's authority, they are obligated to prevent the sale of indulgences, because these indulgent preachers are going against the Pope's authority. 
the bishops are only to permit the indulgent preachers who are actually authorized by the Pope, said Luther. Luther was, however, very naive and unaware that these indulgent preachers such as John Tetzel or Johann Tetzel were actually preaching exactly what Pope Leo X had commanded them to do. So, again, Luther here is just being naive, thinking that these, these indulgence preachers are just rogues, and, in fact, we need to stop them, and if the Pope knew what was going on, he'd come and stop it too. It wasn't really the case. Luther was kind of naive. He thought the Pope was perfect. But he later found out that the Pope wasn't. Thesis 71 and 72 reads... Let him who speaks against the truth concerning papal indulgences be anathema and accursed. But let him who guards against the lust and license of indulgence preachers be blessed. Luther starts the explanation of Thesis 71 by stating that since Christians are commanded to submit to authority, those loudmouth fellows who arrogantly preach against papal authority are to be cursed. For ecclesiastical obedience to the Pope is more admirable than those who push their own feelings concerning small matters. However, Luther had, however, as Luther had pointed out repeatedly, indulgences are only the relaxation of temporal punishments, and all who preach contrary to this true understanding of indulgences should be accursed and anathema. But blessed are those who guard against the heretical doctrines of these indulgence preachers. See, Luther laments over the fact that the indulgence preachers have managed to get away with such heresies. He states that it is understood in the church of his day that if one were to prevent a pilgrim from journeying to Rome or to supply weapons to the Muslim armies or to forge papal documents, he would be considered the most vile of sinners. Yet, what of those who prevent Christians, not from going to Rome, but from going to heaven? And what of those who supply weapons not to the Muslims, but to the demons? And not just any kind of weapon, but our weapon, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And what of those who do not violate... Vo and what of those who not only violate papal decrees, but violate the very holy scriptures themselves? For such is the wickedness of the indulgence preachers. They contaminate the word of God with their lies. They give it to the demons to, new, to use against the church, so that men may be prevented by ent from entering heaven. They have made themselves Pelagians, those who teach that we can save ourselves by our works. And they have made, they have made Pelagians in doctrine and Donatists in practice. Uh, Donatists being those who believed that the efficacy of the sacraments was dependent on the perfection of the pastor um, who administered the sacraments. Therefore, those who strive to purify the Holy Scriptures and lead men out of the darkness of these scholastic opinions and these lies of the indulgent preachers, they are the most worthy to be called blessed. And let us try and wrap up this, uh, this Bible study with Thesis 73 and 74, which again go together. Thesis 73 writes, Just as the Pope justly thunders against those who by any means whatsoever contrive harm to the sale of indulgences. And 74, but much more does he intend to thunder against those who use indulgences as a pretext to contrive harm to holy love and truth. Luther writes that the authority of the keys, whether used rightly or wrongly, is to be respected as any other work of God. Therefore, the Pope is just when he thunders against those who contrive harm to the sale of indulgences. But it is even more just when he thunders against those who use the sale of indulgences to contrive harm to the holy love and truth. As Luther says, however much this power of the keys must be honoured, we must not be so dastardly as not to reprove its abuse and resist it. We are to submit to the authority of both the church and the state. 
but that does not mean that we can't rebuke heresy and error, and if need be, resist those errors. For even the apostles in the midst of torture submitted to their government, but still denounced their abuses constantly. For example, if the Pope deprived communion from a faithful and good teacher, one must support that decision and not condemn the authority, but one must not respect it to the point where he approves of it as a good deed, for he has only to be for he has only be excommunicated due to a misuse of the keys, and if he were to comprise the truth and seek absolution, he should commit an even greater error. He should bear the power of the keys, this is the Pope, should bear the power of the keys, but not approve them. Even if he means, oh sorry, this pastor should bear the power of the keys, but not approve them. Even if this means dying in a state of excommunication. In other words, Luther goes, look, if a pope is going to, you know, defrock someone unfairly, well, then we kind of, we accept that decision, but we don't have to call the decision good. And we can stand in the way of the pope, even if it means excommunication. So as Luther continues, as for those who preach the remission of sins via indulgences, they are to be excommunicated, for their practice is contrary to truth and love. It would be better to do away with indulgences altogether, says Luther, for we can be Christians without indulgences. But those who have been preaching indulgences have done away with love and compassion and faith. Here Luther says, if the Pope knew what was happening, then he would have indulgences eliminated in order that people might first of all return to mutual love. For most people in Luther's day, they do not believe that works of love are better than indulgences. On the contrary, they believed that they can do nothing better than buy an indulgence. The poor people have no faithful teacher to correct them and to dispose this heretical and destructive opinion. But, only, but the people only have the indulgence preachers who strongly urge them to go and buy indulgences. So yeah, that's kind of uh, Thesis 74. We'll pick up our next study with Thesis 75. I've been your host, Reverend Jake Zabel. Goodbye and God bless.